Welcome to St. Giles Presbyterian Church. We are a caring community of faith in the heart of the Glebe. My name is Paul Wu. I'm a minister of the congregation, uh, and I will be leading worship this morning. A word of congratulation uh, to Robert Patchett and April Arthrail, uh, who's um, met, well, who made their covenant of marriage here at St. Giles yesterday morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, Robert Patchett uh, is associated, uh, connected to St. Giles through uh, the Cameron Highlander. Uh, he's the former commander of the Cameron, uh, and for those who may remember him, uh, he was also instrumental uh, in the, the Christmas uh, fundraising uh, event that St. Giles have held uh, for a number of years and uh, that, that concert event and uh, that, that was actually Robert Patch's idea uh, and <clears throat> so uh, so uh, a, a word of uh, congratulation uh, to them and may God bless uh, their marriage the uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, we have a Tete prayer service here in uh, St. Giles at 7 o'clock. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for three scripture readers. Uh, if you are planning to attend and would like to read the scripture, uh, the, the Tete prayer scriptures are often uh, very short passages. Uh, and uh, so I invite uh, anyone who uh, would like to give the try, let me know. And <clears throat> uh, uh, and before, uh, as we gather and worship here this morning, I also like to acknowledge uh, that the land uh, on which we gather uh, is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin people has been living here since time immemorial. So we are honored and, uh, and, and, and re, uh, that we're able to gather here uh, this morning. My mind is just jumbo this morning. I don't know what's going on. Words just not coming out properly. I hope that you will bear with me. Um, I'd like to invite you to join me in this responsive call to worship and that is printed in the bulletin. Here God speaks to us words of challenge and comfort. Here Jesus stands among us, calling us to act of mercy. Even now the Holy Spirit is moving in our midst Building us with hope and inspiring us to faithfulness. Let us worship God every three and every one. Let us praise God's holy name together. Let us now sing hymn 438 when morning gilds the sky. Jesus. 
morning. Um, I'm going to ask you this morning a question that may seem a bit unfair, uh, because this question uh, is something that I think uh, would trouble most people here, uh, even the adults. So, but I, I just like to uh, get a sense of uh, how you would react. So picture this, uh, and, and I'm sure that you have encountered this before, that when you walk by a street and you see a beggar sitting on the road, on the street, someone who's looking unshaved and their clothes are messy and they may even smell a little and they hold their hands out to you or maybe they're holding a cup, what would you do? What have you done? Do you give them money? Maybe, maybe your, your mother will give you a little coin that you can put it in their cup, maybe. Or do you just walk by and pretend that you don't see them? Stay away, if they're like over there, I go across. No, no. Do you acknowledge them, smile at them? Yes? Picture this, if the same beggar, the same person, now decided that they want to camp out right in front of your door where you live, right in front, well, not, 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 not in immediately, but on the sideway, on the sidewalk, still in the public property, but right outside of your door, now you've got to cross this person every day, in and out, in and out, in and out. You have to cross this person every time. What would you do? Yes, you would still smile at them? I, I, I see, I see uh, your mother's eyes and she's not too sure. And uh, are, will you like uh, maybe give them a little kick? Tell them to go away? No, no. Will you, uh, when they're not there, they're, they're, their bag is still there, like will you take the bags and just dump it in the trash? No, you won't do that. Or maybe you will call the cop, call the police? No. I'll tell you what, uh, as I said, this is a, not a fair question to you because these are adult problems. These are not kids' problems. So when you see something like that, you, you just leave it to your parents to, to take care of it. And you just let your parents know. But I will ask you this, is that you don't ignore the beggars on the street. <coughs> that when you walk by, even you may not have money, and people have been debating whether we should give money to beggars on the street. There are pros and cons. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to do to simply acknowledge them. See them. Don't ignore them. See them. Smile at them. And if you have the courage, you can even say, hi, how are you? Okay, you can do that? Good, excellent. And, and as you grow up more, and you will know that <coughs> um, this is a, a persistent problem, and Jesus said even 2,000 years ago, the poor will always be with us. It's a reminder to all of us how fortunate we are and how blessed we are uh, that God has given us so much. And then 
God teach us, Jesus teach us to share what we have with others. Let's come together in the short prayer. Let us pray. Father God, I want to give you thanks and for indeed you have been good to us and you have kept us warm with a roof over our head, with food that keep, kept us from being hungry and you have given us a church uh, 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 are, are just like a family that we're able to uh, learn about uh, you and learn about your words and your teachings to us. And we pray that uh, we will always be mindful of those uh, who are less fortunate than us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go and have fun. Please join me in this prayer of adoration and the unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Creating God, beauty and intricacy mark your creation. Praise and worship mark our response. As the season change, we see you are still at work in the world, transforming hearts and situations we praise you for all you do to repair injustice, to bring peace to places of war, working for goodness to prevail in all nations. Renew our energy to mission this autumn and open our eyes to new opportunities to reach out in the name of Jesus. Through the power of the Spirit, make us participants of your kingdom bringing justice and joy into the world you love. And our prayer continues in the unison prayer of confession. Compassionate God, we confess we often turn away from those in need so that we do not have to see pain, suffering, or injustice right before our eyes. We don't like to feel uncomfortable or press into service the daily sufferings of our neighbor inconvenient us. Forgive us and give us courage to love others as you love us and reach out with the care we have witnessed in Jesus. And our prayer concludes with the prayer that the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The prophet Micah declared that God requires us three things. That is, to do justice, to love kindness, and to humbly walk with our God. And to all who repent, who act for justice, and seek to serve God and neighbors in kindness, God offers forgiveness and peace. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading today First reading is from the book of Amos, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Here, the prophet of northern Israel continue to speak against, but this time both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. But he's not speaking to the common people 
he was speaking to the elite, uh, to the ruling upper class uh, of the North and the South, and listen to what he has to say. And the second reading uh, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verse 19 to 31, um, it's a story that Jesus, uh, well, told, and, um, and, and it's a familiar story for most of us who grew up in church, uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, and, and I'm inviting you uh, that as you hear it this time, to reflect on the warning that Jesus is speaking. Is that a warning against all rich people uh, or uh, it's actually for a particular person? Uh, just think about that. And Jane is going to lead us in uh, our reading today. Our first reading comes from Amos, chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria, the notables of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel resorts. Cross over to Cana and see there, and see. From there go to Hamath the Great, and then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is your territory greater than their territory? You who put far away the evil day and bring near a reign of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and, like David, improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. A response of reading is Psalm 146. We shall sing the second refrain. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob. Whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made the heavens and the sea, all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts, lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. But the way of the wicked God brings to ruin. But the, the Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord.
Second reading is Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who, belonged, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us now sing him, uh, Jesus Christ is Waiting, it's from Voices United uh, 111. The lyric is printed in the bulletin.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is not an overstatement to say that Jesus didn't quite get along uh, with the religious authority of his days. Throughout the gospel account, Jesus was seemingly at odd repeatedly uh, against the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, experts in the law, or synagogue rulers. At times, Jesus went out of his way to pick a fight, like healing on Sabbath, uh, or overturning tables of money money changers uh, in the temple of Jerusalem. And other times, the religious authorities were always watching Jesus, waiting for the right moment to pounce on him, to catch him doing something uh, mildly unlawful. The relationship between them, that is between uh, Jesus and the religious authority of his time, was truly hostile, adversarial, and dysfunctional. Yet, have you ever wondered why Jesus never spoke against the high priest or against the Sadducees, uh, that is the religious aristocracy uh, that surrounded the high priest uh, that made up of the religious court uh, of the Sanhedrin, which gave real authority to that high priestly office? Have you wondered? And let's be clear here, Pharisees were lay people who were zealous uh, for the law, for observing and and keeping the law uh, in the grand scheme of Judaism of the first century. The Pharisees were, what shall I call them, middle management. The Pharisees took their marching order uh, from the boss above. And and here, I'm not talking about God. Uh, Had it actually been God, uh, it it wouldn't have caused so much friction with Jesus. But I'm referring to the office of the high priest. Now, allow me to use this comparable. It's like trying to dissect what is wrong with uh, the Russian society, uh, the modern, current Russian society, uh, by listing their aggressive militarism, uh, their toxic chauvinism, uh, their, um, uh, the control of mafia uh, on the underground economy and on the daily lives of the people, uh, or pointing out their misguided religious nationalism Uh, doing all these without ever pointing a finger at their president, Vladimir Putin. Of all the woes that Jesus spoke against the Pharisees, or the East of Pharisees, why was Jesus seemingly silent against the true religious authority of his days? that is, the high priest Caiaphas and his extended family. And what a corrupt family that was. The true architect and the patriarch uh, of that family was not Caiaphas. Uh, It was actually Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Officially, Annas served as the high priest from 6 AD to 16, uh, 15 AD, uh, so sort of during the formative years uh, of Jesus. He might even have met the boy Jesus, uh, the 12 year old, who for three days uh, 
impress many at the temple court. And in the story recounted in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 2. According to the author of John in chapter 18, uh, it was Annas and Caiaphas who later conspired together to, serve, to, to sacrifice Jesus, quote unquote, uh, leading to his crucifixion uh, with the reasoning that it would be better for one man, that is Jesus, uh, to die than for the whole nation to be destroyed. <coughs> this pair, Annas and Caiaphas, uh, appeared again in Acts chapter 4, where they presided over the Sanhedrin trial uh, of the Apostle Peter and John uh, post-resurrection. Now, according to Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, Annas was succeeded by his son, Eleazar, uh, who served as high priest from 16 to 17 AD, two short years. And then Caiaphas, the son-in-law, uh, took over at 18 AD. Uh, Caiaphas, whose clever diplomacy uh, with the Roman Empire, resulted in his relatively long tenure uh, all the way until 36 AD. Afterwards, the four remaining sons of Annas, and if you're counting, he's got five sons. Uh, so the four remaining sons of Anna each took turn at the office of the high priest uh, intermittently. Uh, they're all very short tenures, a year or two, uh, with the last uh, being the year 63 AD. It's not too far-fetched to say that Annas, uh, with his five sons and his son-in-law Caiaphas, had close to total control of the office of the high priest, exerting overwhelming influence on the religious landscape of the first century Judaism. And just to be clear, in case one might be tempted uh, to think that the office of the high priest uh, was hereditary, it was not. Ever since the intertestamental period, that's the 400 years between the last book of, uh, uh, of Old Testament, uh, Malachi, and to the birth of Jesus, uh, during that gap, uh, which biblical scholar call it the intertestamental period. And during this period, high priest became more of a political office, granted and sold by whatever imperial authority of the day to the highest bidder. It was competitive, bought and sold, uh, due to the fact that a high priest uh, could legitimately collect the temple tax. And shrewd ones uh, would often line their own pockets and, and to enrich themselves, their families, and their cronies. <coughs> Anna, <coughs> Anna and his family had truly perfected the system of corruption. And they were rich beyond measure, and worst of all, they were essentially above the law. And I'm using law as the law of Moses, God's law. So why didn't Jesus, with his tendency to call out religious authorities of his days, why didn't Jesus ever call out Annas and his corrupt family? of five sons and a son-in-law to account. Well, perhaps he did. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, as told in our gospel reading today in Luke chapter 16. I'm not going to repeat the story here again. It's a familiar story, but suffice to say that it is a simple 
in a graphic story, right down to the gory details uh, of dog licking the sores of Lazarus and, and the rich man in agony tormented in the midst of flames of Hades. I will say that the story is the only passage in the Bible uh, that actually describes Hades or hell. If I should ask members of the congregation and to close your eyes and to picture hell in your mind and imagine fire would be your primary element and agony be overwhelming sensation. For those more informed, Dante's Inferno and the seven circles of hell uh, might be the picture in your mind. Ever since uh, the medieval age, painters and writers had conditioned our mind to picture hell in pretty much the same uniform way. So now you know. Should anyone ever ask you this trivial question uh, of where in the Bible do we find the actual description of hell? Uh, well, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. In a one-line sentence uh, detail uh, told by Jesus to illustrate a simple point. Now, before we get to that point, I do want to say that Hades uh, is the Greek word for hell, uh, finds its equivalent in Hebrew, uh, that is Sheol. Uh, in the early Hebrew mindset, uh, Sheol is a uh, subterranean dark place where all people, regardless whether you're righteous or unrighteous, uh, all people would go, would end up after death. It is a place that nothing much happens. Uh, the dead uh, simply stand around and perhaps they eat dirt. Coming back to the story of Lazarus and the rich man, what is the point that Jesus was conveying? Stories of Jesus <clears throat> often offer a wide range of interpretations, and some more convincing than others. And interpretations do fall out of favor over time as the society we live in uh, changes and evolves. In this particular story, uh, I'm not going to tell you the one point, but I will present to you four interpretations. First, the fear of Hades or hell of ending up in that eternal fiery torment shall govern all our conducts here on earth while we're still alive. What we do, what we say, how we think, and how we act and treat others will all one day be judged by the Lord God, who is holy and righteous and just. Those who are deemed worthy or justified, either by the law or by faith, shall receive their eternal reward, and that is salvation and eternal life in heaven. I don't think I need to say more as most of us who grew up uh, in the traditional Christian faith uh, should know this interpretation quite well. The second interpretation hinges on the reversal of the rich man and Lazarus. This reversal is a sign of the coming kingdom of God, where the proud will be humbled those on high will be brought low, and those 
and the righteous suffering poor shall be lifted up. Such reversal reveals the innate character of God who have a preferential care and love for those who are on the margin. We see this in the commandments of the Old Testament where the widows, the orphans, the aliens or strangers uh, were to be particularly cared for by the community of faith of Israel. We see this in the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament where blessed are the poor or the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. And truth be told, I had preached my share of sermons over the years on sharing our wealth with the needy, with the poor, uh, lest we be judged unworthy by the Almighty when our time comes. The third interpretation, that is, to understand the story as a political satire, a, a subversive one at, at that, as Jesus calling out the high priestly family of Annas and Caiaphas. Such interpretation, though I should add, is not novel, uh, but uh, decidedly in the minority. It is consistent with the Old Testament prophetic critique, and we find that uh, in the book of Ezekiel particularly, against shepherds of Israel who care only for their own interests, their own preservations, and who by their unethical and corrupt actions had scattered the flock that was entrusted to them. Shepherds of Israel, it's a metaphor to the ruling class, kings, priests, and even prophets. Such interpretation should put a real scare into unethical uh, or immoral leaders of the Christian church, of pastors, ministers, priests, bishops, cardinals, and even popes alike, that Hades or hell with that fiery eternal torment, that agonizing fire is particularly reserved for them. Repentance by then or in the afterlife uh, during that torment is simply too late as there is a uncrossable chasm between them, the self-proclaimed righteous, uh, and those who are truly righteous before the eyes of the Lord. Last interpretation, but not least, and this interpretation really sums up all the others, and, and uh, I hope it will be your takeaway uh, for today. Where the law and the prophets fall short where even Lazarus coming back to life is not enough to cross that uncrossable chasm. The resurrected Christ, Jesus, is enough and is able. Christ is the hope for all of us. Christ is our salvation, our light. We are thus to pattern our mindset as that of Christ Jesus. A song by early Christian church and recorded in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul recounted about Jesus who being in the very nature of God 
did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, a slave, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus all, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. In the following prayers of the people, I like you I'd like to invite you to join me responsively. Uh, so when you hear the prompt, uh, when I say God of all creature, great and small, I invite you to respond, make us stewards of your creation. So God of all creatures, great and small, make us stewards of your creation. Let us pray. Yes? Yes, God of all creature, great and small, make us stewards of your creation. Let us pray. O oh God of awe and wonder, we look around at the beauty of this world and the worlds beyond us and sense that you have given each precious thing its place and a way to sustain itself. Thank you for the care you hold for your whole creation. We also look around at the aching world and sense that many precious things are under threat. Too many pieces of your creation have fallen out of balance with each other. Show us how we can help restore that balance and protect what is at risk for the good of your whole creation. God of all creatures, great and small, make us door of your creation. God of the spirit that gives life, we look around at the people of this world and see your image and dignity in every variety of faith and culture. Thank you for the care you hold for all humankind. Yet we look around at the people of this world and see the aching of the hungry and the hurting. We hear the groans of parents whose children die in their arms. We feel the tears of children whose parents are no more. We know neighbors who are suffering. And here's of strangers uh, who can't imagine how to make it through tomorrow. Awaken our generosity to offer what healing and hope we can to the lives you cherish in, in every neighborhood and nation. O oh God of all creatures, great and small, make us steward of your creation. God of promise and possibility, we look around at places where people collide with one another. We hear the grumblings of nations lock into all rivalry and grievances. We watch the jousting of political leaders 
impressed more by polls than life-giving policies. We worry about futures of our community and our children. We hear your call to do justice and live generously. Guide us as citizens to act for justice that bring peace and well-being to communities near and far. Bless the ministry supported by the Presbyterian sharing across Canada and across the world and grow in us the care and commitment to contribute to this outreach. God of all creatures, great and small, make us steward of your creation. O God of faith and faithfulness, we look at ourselves and sometimes doubt. Doubt if we can make a difference or have an impact. Challenge us today to recognize the power we do have in love and compassion through courage and commitment with laughter and friendship by generosity and mercy you inspire within us. You know these gifts, we know your power. Through all these gifts, our lives have been changed. And using these gifts in our lives, bring Christ's love and mercy to the world you love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing hymn 638, Take Time to Be Holy.
We're going to take this time to welcome uh, those who are joining this, our worship service, either on teleconference uh, or on Zoom. Anyone on the teleconference? Good morning, Jean. Good to hear you. Let me welcome those uh, who are uh, joining by Zoom. Uh, I see, I see Bob. Hi, Bob. Hello, there. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I see David and Barbara. Hi, David. Hi, Barbara. Good morning, Paul. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you. Uh, I see Dorothy. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Hi. Good to hear from you. Not at all. <laughs> Good. Let me acknowledge uh, those who are here in person, uh, Katie uh, and Heather. Thank you. And Nora, good to see you. Jane, our scripture reader, and Michelle. And I see Stan, I see Jean, I see Bill, and I see Jan. And Megan, good to see you. Glad that you can join us. And I see uh, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. Hey, I see Nick and Isaac and our duty elder uh, standing at the back, Kate. And um, uh, Rob. <laughs> are, are uh, providing technical support as Rob at the back. Uh, I see Laura. I see Nelson. Good to see you. And uh, Kathy uh, and Pauline. Good to see you again. And uh, Bonaventure. Good to see you. Uh, I see Don and Kay and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Mary, they're downstairs with the kids. Peace. morning. There are just a few announcements. Uh, the first one being um, the Edict of Ordination or Admission of Elders. Whereas Christy Kalonga and Laura Brandon, members of St. Giles Presbyterian Church, have been duly elected to the eldership by this congregation and have been approved by the session, notice is hereby given that the session will proceed to ordain Christy Kalonga and to admit Laura Brandon and Christy Kalonga to that office on the ninth day of October in the year 2022 at 10.30 a.m., unless some valid objection has been given unto the moderator within 10 days from this date. Our other announcements, we uh, like to remind everybody that we do have coffee hour after service, so please come downstairs afterwards. And we are also looking for more volunteers to help out with coffee hour, so if you'd like information, you can always um, talk to Kate Tate. Um, there are a few weekly events happening here, um, so coffee hour, Monday mornings by teleconference. Um, Paul's already mentioned the Teze service on Wednesday. Thursday is choir practice. Friday is Bible study, and it's also by teleconference. And there is a, a mission moment there um, talking about what it is to give to Presbyterian sharings and how they support uh, different charities. And Stan has an announcement about the walk for the Centertown Church's Emergency Food Center. Yeah, so I'd like to add a little bit to the announcement that's been printed in the bulletin. It's in today's bulletin. You can look back at it. Uh, that's got basic information, but I wanted to 
to add a little bit to it. Uh, I think uh, with today's sermon, uh, uh, this uh, uh, fundraiser by the Centertown Church's Social Action Committee in support of the food center here in Centertown uh, is really important. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's one way that we can uh, begin to say, yes, uh, we're not going to pass by and ignore what's happening to other people. And all of us are probably uh, experiencing the effects of inflation, which we've had recently in a way that we haven't had for a very long time. Uh, but uh, some of us uh, can survive quite nicely, paying a little bit more at the grocery store and so on, and uh, uh, things don't bother us too much. Uh, but for those who are on low and fixed incomes, uh, it is really uh, a difficult uh, situation, and more of them now are coming to food centers across the city uh, to, to get a bit of, bit of help, because once you paid your rent uh, and your food is a major part of your remaining uh, money that you've got every month, uh, that uh, suddenly when the prices go up, uh, that means that uh, you're in hard choices of what, what can I afford to buy and uh, how could I feed myself or my household. Uh, and so I think uh, that's really uh, uh, important this year, perhaps more than other years. Uh, Jean and I will be doing the walk. Uh, we had been inviting other people to join us. At this point, no one has confirmed that they want to come and walk with us. Uh, uh, but everyone uh, is able to donate. Uh, and people who like to make cast donations, uh, Jean's been taking them. We haven't had too many yet, uh, uh, but we hope more people will uh, uh, come forward and do that. Uh, if you want to do it the easy way, you can do it online, and the, uh, the website for uh, CASAC is there. You can go to that, and it will take you to uh, the Canada Helps, where uh, you can make your donation there. Uh, and if you're doing it online, if you could please, uh, uh, you can designate uh, your donation in support of either a team or, or, or a person. And so in, in our case, our team is called St. Giles Walkers. Uh, so if you get that way, uh, I, I'll get a message back indicating that, uh, uh, that someone from St. Giles has, has done a don donation. Uh, and so uh, last year we, we made about got about $1,800 being donated. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether we'll make it there this, this year, but certainly uh, uh, give it some thought about how much you want to contribute to helping others in our community who are, are really, uh, I think, beginning to struggle uh, with the costs that, of their living. Thank you very much. the offering is being collected and brought forward, uh, we are reminded by prophets uh, and parables uh, again and again to share our wealth with those living on the margin of our society. Uh, your contribution to the life and mission of St. Giles uh, and to the Presbyterian Church in Canada through Presbyterian sharing uh, help change the world by bringing God's love and goodness to those standing outside the gate. Let us stand and let us sing the doxology. Let's pray. Loving God, we bring you our gifts, grateful that we have something to share. 
and glad to be part of a network of mission uh, that circles the globe. Bless the ministry supported by St. Giles and, and by Presbyterian sharings, as well uh, as uh, mission of our denominations around the world. And use our gifts to multiply their impact in the world you love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now sing uh, 760, where cross uh, the crowded ways of life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you from this day and forevermore. Amen.